All right, Barum Swallow and Modified Barum Swallow, which we also call a Cine. Uh, what's the purpose of the esophagram? Well, we're going to look at the form and function of the pharynx and esophagus. Most often, we're looking for structures, foreign bodies, anatomic abnormalities of the esophagus. Uh, what's the reason? So physicians will order this study. Usually, the patient's having some sort of swallowing problem, pain, heartburn, or uh, dysphagia is our number one. So I highlighted that in red, difficulty swallowing, possibly history of cancer, or the Nissen fundal plication. What's your role? So you're gonna prepare your room, prepare your contrast. You're gonna obtain that clinical history. So same questions we asked for the upper GI. Have you had anything to eat since midnight? What symptoms are you having? What's bringing you in? Have you had any surgeries to chest and abdomen areas? Any chance of pregnancy? And then, explain the procedure in words they can understand, right? Uh, I always introduce my radiologist that comes in and you're gonna warn your patient that the table's gonna go up and down so it's not a surprise for them, okay? Post floral projections, what, what are you gonna do for overheads at the end? Right now, um, where you barely do any overheads for our floor, but routinely you guys are only gonna do this RAO drinking for a barium. So what is the REO esophagus position? The patient's in a 35 to 40 degree oblique. Your central ray is, you're gonna find sort of T5, T6, so similar to that central ray of chest or APT spine, right? Um, two inches lateral to mid sagittal plane. So I find mid clavicle um, on the upside here, all right? And I look at that. So I do a little bit of light right at their mouth and try and um, get as far down as possible. You're using a 1417 cassette. Build your patient's head up so their head's not tilting down. Give them a cup with a straw. Make sure there's enough barium in that cup and then coach them. So you have to tell your patient, I need you to take sips and swallows, sips and swallows one right after another to really fill that esophagus for this study. What, how do you evaluate it? You wanna rotate the patient enough where the esophagus is not on the spine so it needs to be between the spine and the heart. You also want this um, connection between the esophagus and the stomach, and I try and get as high up here as I can. And ideally, you want barium in there. <laughs> Lateral esophagram, you're never gonna do, um, but it's the same central ray. You're using mid-coronal plane instead of mid-sagittal plane, right, because it's a lateral. Your collimated field is gonna be five to six inches wide is what they recommend. I don't want the entire chest on and even on your REO esophagus, I don't want to see both sides of the rib cage. I want you to cone to the esophagus. Evaluating, you want to see the whole esophagus. Esophagus is going to be between the spine and the heart, arms up and out of the way and get your patient in a true lateral. This alternate swimmer's lateral you're never going to see either, but the textbook identifies this as a way to see this upper esophagus, right? So anytime we do a swimmer's position, we're usually trying to see up within here in between the shoulders. Um, the AP or PA esophagus, we don't do either. Um, so I'm gonna move on from that. LAO, you won't see this either, um, but if for some reason the patient, you know, can't get into an RAO. The only difference with the LAO is that the esophagus is now between the spine and the hilar region. These next few slides are possible clinical in indications for the esophagram, so things we could find or things we could prove. Achalasia, we call this a tortured esophagus. So you can see in the image here, it's tortured, it has like these waves to it. It's a rare disease of the muscle of the lower esophageal body and the lower esophageal sphincter that prevents the relaxation of the sphincter. Um, so they don't tend to have the peristalsis that normally moves the food down into their stomach. So it actually will look like this and it'll start to sort of expand, right? Versus the normal esophagus here. And it usually has this tightened area at some point. The Nissen fundal plication, this is a surgery um, for patients who are having a lot of issues with um, reflux. This is the surgical treatment um, for that. So if they're having issues with this, we will do a swallow study and see if um, there's any issues, if the Nissen has come apart um, or anything like that. Barrett's esophagus is um, a complication of GERD as well. It's when the normal tissue lining of the esophagus changes to tissue that resembles the lining of the intestine. 
Um, this also increases the patient's risk for an adenocarcinoma, which is a serious and potentially fatal cancer of the esophagus. Esophageal varices, you're going to see this most often in patients um, who, have, who drink a lot of alcohol. They may be cirrhosis patients, um, and they tend to have a tendency to develop bleeding with a possible perforation. The Zenker's diverticulum, well, let's first go to diverticulum. What's a diverticulum? It's an abnormal sac or pouch formed at a weak point in the wall of an area of anatomy. And the Zenker's diverticulum is in the mucosa of the pharynx in the upper esophagus that causes debilitating dysphagia, right? If you're having food or liquids sitting in this sac, it's really difficult to kind of get it up and out and swallow it. Um, uh, sometimes it's looking for a foreign body, fish bone, chicken bone, swallowed coin, needle, toothbrush is always interesting. Um, some textbook ways to diagnose esophageal reflux. The two breathing exercises um, are Valsalva maneuver and Mueller. And Valsalva, you guys have probably seen in the REO drinking position um, in your floral studies. The radiologist will ask the patient to cut, take a few drinks and swallows and then ask them to bear down and squeeze their um, abdomen muscles, kind of like they're trying to move their bowels. Um, so that's that one. The Mueller one is different. They exhale and then try and inhale against their closed glottis. The water test. So they'll put the patient in LPO, have them swallow water through a straw, and if the barium is regurgitated up into the esophagus, then they have reflux. The compression paddle, they may have the patient turn prone and put pressure on the stomach to try and push reflux up and out. The toe touch maneuver um, is specific in your textbook for reflux and hiatal hernia. The one we see the most in our clinical site is where they have the patient supine and they have them lift their legs up and do a cough. And that's how they check for reflux. The modified barium swallow, a lot of times we call it a cine, uh, simply because we're recording it, um, is the exam done in conjunction with a speech pathologist. So they will come to the department um, and they prepare everything and they essentially run the exam with the patient. So their sort of analysis of um, swallowing the three phases, the oral, pharyngeal, and upper esophagus, and they're determining whether or not food or liquid is entering the patient's, the person's lungs, which is bad. Um, it's known as aspiration. So it usually um, is done upright. Oh, this so is just a picture of those swallowing um, methods here. But um, the patient's gonna be sitting upright and we call it the cine chair. And the speech pathologist is gonna administer the materials. So they have thinner liquids, thicker liquids. They have usually um, a Fig Newton as like a cookie substance, uh, applesauce and a few other things, but they mix it all with barium so that we can see it. Um, and they're gonna see what consistencies the patient aspirates and if they aspirate. Most often the patients that we do these on are stroke patients, head injury patients, um, history of cancer, they may have special needs, and it's usually prior to discharge. So they are either going home or they're going to um, sort of a facility that they're gonna need to have a certain diet made for them. We do these on pediatrics as well. Usually the patient is coughing or choking when they're eating or drinking, so um, they do a modified swallow just to see how they're doing. Infants, it's just gonna be thin barium through a bottle. Um, as they get a little bit bigger, they get to have a few other things, but the infants are really quick. This is what aspiration looks like. So. Remember your trachea is anterior to your esophagus, right? So the black is the contrast coming down into the airway and that's what we don't want. And just another image there of the aspiration. Um, some terms I want you to know is this mastication for chewing, deglutition for swallowing, and then this is just a breakdown of sort of the process and times. Some info about the esophagus, it originates at C6, passes through the diaphragm at T10, and it joins at the esophagastric junction at T11. 
There's two indentations in the esophagus. One is at the aortic arch, and the second one's at the left primary bronchus. So it usually does two curves due to normal patient anatomy. Um, and this is just sort of um, an image for you of locations for the esophagus anatomy-wise. The three parts of the pharynx, so there's nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. So these three locations here in the middle. So review those for me. There's also accessory organs in the mouth in their oil cavity, the salivary glands, and there's three. There's parotid, sublingual, and submandibular. They're going to produce a lot of saliva for you. Uh, but this really aids in the chewing and dissolving of food and swallowing. Barium. You're most likely going to use some form of barium in your study. So, and barium is considered a positive contrast or radiopaque. Um, it's a chalky liquid. It's sort of chalky, powdery, and then we mix it with water, or it's pre-mixed with water, either one. Um, but the atomic number is 56, and Dave always loves to ask you that question, so write that in some sort of book for me. You have two options for barium. You either have a thin version or a thick version, and I believe your thick barium at the hospital is a green label now, but it used to be blue, all right? But the ratios are just different. So um, it's one-to-one -one water to barium for the thin, and either three-to-one or four-to-one ratio um, for the barium to water. It's really thicker substance. It's more milkshake, um, and it's a little harder to get down. The barium pill is used to detect subtle esophageal structures. They're all the same size, so they're 12 millimeter size, and the radiologist knows this. Um, it provides sort of a gauge for them. If the pill gets stuck somewhere, then they know it's either smaller than the 12 millimeters and can kind of give them an idea of how big the stricture is. And you can see the pill going down and see where it gets stuck. So they'll usually take an image of where it gets stuck. If there's any question of a possible perforation for your patient, you're going to use one of the water soluble options. Um, we use the Isoview 300. And I probably should find a picture for that, but um, for ours. So if on your reason, it's always important to read your reasoning, clinical question on your orders. If it says perforation, you're not going to use barium. Water-soluble contrast can be absorbed by the body and it's excreted by the kidneys in case there's a perforation and it goes where it's not supposed to go. Barium does not. Barium will just stay there. All right. Two terms I want to review again is radiopaque and radiolucent. So radiopaque blocks the x-rays and it shows up as a light color. So your white barium is going to be radiopaque. Radiolucent, the x-rays pass right through. It shows up like a dark, uh, as a dark color. So that would be the air, right? Your Bucky slot shield. So in older equipment, if you move this Bucky tray, the shield collapses. You guys, in our rooms, the shield stays up no matter where you move the bucky. Um, but in older equipment, if you move the bucky shield, if you move the bucky tray and the bucky shield is open and you are flooring, you are getting some scatter to you. Um, the bucky slot shield needs to be 0.25 millimeters of lead. Some things to just review again are your cardinal rules. So your time, distance, and shielding. How can you prevent your exposure um, as a technologist in the floor room utilizing the lead curtain? Make sure your lead curtain is on. That's going to reduce your dose. Don't turn around. Make sure you have lead on with a thyroid shield. Try and stay behind your radiologist and not up by the patient's head or feet. I want you to have lead on and a thyroid shield. And your lead needs to be at least 0.5 millimeters of lead. There is uh, an alarm if your radial just reads five minutes, gets to five minutes of fluoro, that'll alert. And remember, we have that on the C-arm as well. The FDA um, is the one who set that time. So your fluoro machine has to have a five-minute timer and an audible tone that goes off at that five minutes. There's also a minimum source to skin distance, which is 15 inches for stationary fluoro units. It's 12 inches for C arms, but 15 inches for um, stationary fluoro. There's also a skin entrance exposure set by the FDA, and it's supposed to be 10 R per minute for fluoroscopy. I think that's the end.